The existence of demons have long been known to the creatures who stalk the night of the world of darkness. The Sabbat fears their influence and seeks to root out their worshippers with fire and blade, their inquisition experts at spotting signs of infernalism in their midst. The mages warn against the double-edged sword of dealing with these creatures, for their gifts always come at a steep price. And to the Pharah, they are creatures of the worm, corrupted spirits who must be destroyed. But what are they really? We learned previously that they were created at the dawn of time to help shape the world that we inhabit. We know that they foresaw a great suffering the Creator would inflict upon humanity, who at the time had not awakened to their full potential. And they finally intervened in the Creator's plans, revealing themselves to humanity, and teaching them all manner of things. They were cast out of heaven for their betrayal, and a long and bloody war was fought between the host of heaven and the malefactors, the angels of earth. The malefactors lost, were cast down in the abyss, and left to rot in their pain and suffering. Their leader, Lucifer, disappeared, and over time so too did their old generals, called away never to return. Yet in 1999, the gates of the abyss cracked, and the fallen were released. Some left more than willingly, others at the behest of the princes of hell, forged to explore these cracks in their jail by demons much more powerful than themselves. No angels came to meet them. No angelic host of the heavens stood against the demons as they reached creation once more, basking in the glory of what they had helped make real. The world they found was in a sorry state, for no angels were there to ease the pain of the dying. No angels would ward the wilds or the depths or the skies. Humanity had become overcome with their greed, and they had begun to destroy the mountains, sour the rivers, and fell the deep forests, all in pursuit of gratification that would still be denied them. The world was dying ever faster, and it cried out for release. It desired nothing more than to be destroyed and reborn at the hands of its creators. Yet the demons did not have much time to dwell on this realization, as they felt the pull of the abyss trying to drag them back to their prison. Their only escape were the minds and bodies of the weak and the wounded, mortals who were on the cusp of death. They would force the spirits out and claim these bodies as their own, and their memories with them. In a sense, they would become these humans, but in another they would be mere intruders, unwanted guests who would wear the flesh and memories of their hosts, but who had never lived any of it, had never made the choices these humans had. This rebirth to many demons is what first awoke them to their own reality. Assaulted by a barrage of memories, emotions, and sensations, they would, for the first time in thousands of years, experience something more than just pain and misery and regret. In a sense, by allowing themselves to once more be touched by human nature, these demons would remember what it was like to be an angel. But of course, even these most intense surges of emotions would fade, as they always do, and the now possessed mortal body would rise from the ground, steered now by one of the malefactors, who found that they were no longer who they had been. By merging their demonic spirit with the flesh of a human, they had become both, and neither. Their endless fury and rage were tempered by the limitations of their mortal flesh, and their minds were expanded beyond belief by their demonic potential. They understood the world around them, but only by allowing their mortal memories to bleed into them, and each time they did, they would find it harder and harder to sustain what had kept them sane during their time in the abyss. The more they allowed the mortal form to help them, the more they would begin to realize that they were that mortal, now and that they wanted to be them, too. For a long time after, these demons would simply dwell in their human shells, live the same lives their hosts lived before they died. Some would try to better it, realizing the flaws their hosts suffered and make amends for it, while others would instead become intoxicated by sensations, driving their mortal shells to greater depravities so that they may feel and sense what humans feel and sense. Very few of them wished for the alternative, to return to the abyss would be to lose all of what they had now gained. The mortal body possessed by a fallen needs to either be recently dead, dying, or have a large enough hole in its soul so that a demon may enter it and fill that void. Disillusioned police officers who have seen one too many murder scenes, to social workers filing yet another report on domestic abuse that they know authorities will ignore, are good candidates. 
but so are drug addicts who have no care for their own well-being while they chase their next high, or even a politician who has seen so much of the rotten corruption that rules the world that they give up on their faith in humanity. Sometimes a mortal will even let a demon into their body, or in the body of another, using powerful magic and summoning rituals. It is not always that a possession destroys or removes a body's soul either, meaning that these mortals may find themselves passengers unable to do anything but scream wordlessly in their minds as the demon hijacks their life and their flesh. To sustain themselves and to wield the powers of their angelic nature, a demon requires faith. Faith is the belief in something divine beyond the ordinary, and this is a rare commodity in the world of darkness. Demons can gain this faith in two ways, either by reaping or by being offered it through pacts with mortals. Reaping is simply the act of revealing to a mortal the existence, beyond a doubt, of something beyond the natural, to display their celestial nature and to convince them of the existence of the Creator. This can, of course, be done in many different ways, and many fallen employ their abilities to momentarily transform their mortal host into a reflection of their demonic being, their so-called apocalyptic form. This is an utterly overwhelming experience for most mortals as they come face to face with an angelic, or demonic, creature that threatens to shatter their entire worldview. Reaping faith from such a mortal is easy enough, although a demon must be careful or they may cause lasting damage to their source of faith. All demons struggle with their torment. It is, in a very real sense, the hell that they have created for themselves. Pain, anguish, regret, jealousy, and of course the feeling of betrayal. The Creator cast them into hell. Their charges, humanity, for whom they had bled and died for, turned their backs on them. Some demons are incapable of letting these things go, and thus their torment makes it more difficult for them to forgive and move on. They may find human emotions and values difficult to understand, or frustratingly naive and pointless and thus they may find greater pleasures in bringing a small part of their own pain and suffering onto humanity as vengeance, or simply as an outlet. This torment colors their apocalyptic forms as well. A fallen who is at peace with their past, who has chosen to forgive and move on, may appear as they once did, radiant and angelic, a creature of beautiful perfection. A demon who clings to their hatred, however, may instead appear just as monstrous as legends say, sprouting bat-like wings, multifaceted eyes, and horrible claws and fangs. This is not simply limited to their appearance either. A demon's ability to wield their angelic powers, their lores, is influenced as well. Each lore has two sides to it, the original way that their use was intended, and one more twisted and wicked. Any fallen Elohim can wield both of these, but risk losing themselves to their darker side should they use the latter. A demon who has allowed their torment to run rampant may find that they are no longer able to use their lures for good, their angelic natures no longer accessible to them. Each of the houses of Elohim have lures that are theirs and theirs alone to learn, unless there are extraordinary circumstances. This is natural, as angels were created with a clear purpose in mind, whether that be shaping mountains or caring for the spirits of the dying. These lures also influence how a fallen appears once they assume their apocalyptic form, or also called a visage. As mentioned, a demon may enter into a pact with mortals, and this is the safest and most stable way of earning faith from them. These pacts are not one way, however. A mortal must be given something in return by the demon for there to be a pact, and thus a contract is sealed. It must be something extraordinary, of course, and many demons tend to give their thralls, as they are commonly referred to, a small fraction of their own power, fueled by the thralls' own faith, and then claim the rest for themselves. Of note is that the thralls' relationship with the demon can be amicable or hostile. What matters is how close the two are. If the thrall spends a considerable amount of time each day thinking about their demon master, then that bond is stronger than a mortal who does not. Each fallen has three names by which they may be called. Their host name is the name of the body which they possess. Yet to most demons it is not merely a disguise, but a part of who they now are. Their celestial name is the name they are known as to other angels and demons, and which holds some manner of power over them as well, although limited. Names such as Baal, Lucifer, Mephisto and the like are celestial names. 
Should one know an Elohim's true name, however, there is very little they can do against you if you wield it against them. A true name is eldritch, and often something you cannot produce with your mouth alone. It could be the sound of twenty men shedding tears, to the cry of twin children born under a full moon, or the rustling of wind through a forest of birch trees on a summer's day. Demons are practically immune to magics that control the mind and induce fear, and they cannot be possessed by other beings if they are within their host. They are capable of seeing through most forms of illusion without trouble, being intimately familiar with reality, and they do not age as long as they have faith. Should they lose their last reserves of faith, their mortal bodies will begin to age normally. Demons are also surprisingly resilient to damage and poisons, and are immune to all forms of disease. Should they enter their apocalyptic forms, very little can bring them down as they are able to shrug off even the most grievous of wounds. And due to their connection to reality, demons can also detect the use of supernatural powers near them, and thus they are often quite good at tracking down other night folk, although they may not know what are causing these disturbances as they were imprisoned long before vampires, mages or even werewolves existed. Inevitably these demons will find themselves drawn to each other. They know, deep in their souls, that they are close to the end of the world's existence, and thus they gather together in order to figure out what they should do about it. When next we convene, I will discuss in more detail the many houses of the Elohim, as well as the factions they have created on Earth after their release. The three grandchildren of Cain wait patiently for the time of judgment to arise. Bambi Parsons is a leader with an unbreakable will, Prozion who has been reborn as a god amongst Cain's angels, and Dugal, whose thirst for blood is matched only by his strength of will and purpose. Their child, the Methuselah, control our every move through their timeless jihad. They are her satanic majesty Dani, whose mere presence chills the heart. Maximilian as Hardcastle, a tutor and master of the jihad, Socrates Johnson, a masterful craftsman of stories, Lorne Eason, a trustworthy ally and friend, Alexander Kanehurst, inquisitive explorer and steward of the Kanehursts, and Snow, who oversees the progress of the council patiently from the shadows. On the council of the Primogen are seated Edward Reed, 06, Ian Nichols, the Black Friar, Brandon Hunter Hayden, the Autumn Alchemist, and Michelle Light, wise leaders and of good judgment. This week the council would wish to thank the elder Gaslight88 for his continued support. We deeply appreciate your wise counsel. We would also wish to thank the ancillary Harry Wyckoff, who has remained a staunch supporter through times of peace and times of trouble. Naturally all our elders and silly and neonates receive our gratitude from the bottoms of our hearts. Without your support, this would not be possible. And thank you for watching. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death and hell followed with him.